a lot of people get focused on um, you have to be a dominant person to own this breed. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that that's necessarily an accurate way. Um, and having Dante, you've got a little taste of it, but a Corso is a, is a dog that you have to develop a relationship with. They aren't one that you can just be the quote alpha of the pack because they really take resentment to that. They want to be part of the pack and they'll respect you, but you have to earn their respect. You guys don't understand we're on our way to dropping Dante off to Leroy's house because we are going to pick up our second kind of Corso puppy in Tennessee why are we going all the way to Tennessee well we have been in communication with Dante's breeder since we got Dante and we have noticed that you guys asked a lot of questions about where we got Dante um, what to look for in a kind of Corso um, how could you tell that his temperament was good and we've taken that into consideration a lot and we just saw us going to Tennessee as an opportunity to answer all of your questions and to ask the breeder um, directly about that stuff so we're very excited we saw this as an opportunity to showcase the breed to showcase how beautiful they are and I mean come on guys it's gonna be a farm with a bunch of kind of Corsos like puppies they're gonna be like fat and, and cute and chubby and, and it's gonna be awesome. It's gonna be so awesome. Tomorrow we're planning on leaving from New Jersey in the morning and heading out to Tennessee. So yeah, see you guys then. Bye! So there are eight in total here. Uh, yes, correct. Six girls and two boys. How long have you been uh, breeding them? Breeding them? Um, I have to look to be for sure, and I should know this, but it's 12 or 13 years. It's a long time. Yeah. <laughs> it's a long time. And I did not breed dogs prior to the Corso. The Corso is the only breed of dogs that I have ever bred. Wow. Um, my husband breeds um, on a very limited scale Malinois. Oh, I, um, I, saw, had, I saw some pictures. Yeah, we have one litter of Malinois. Um, and I, we believe she's pregnant again. What kind of socialization do they get with this? Uh, when they're this young, do you do anything to try to socialize? Um, what they get at this stage is mainly just me handling them. But yeah, so for right now, what they get is just the interaction. Um, <laughs> good job, baby. Puppy ball. There's so many puppies in here. But we do bottle feed every litter, even though it's not necessary, according to a lot of breeders. Um, bottle feeding them, even if the mother's supplying enough milk, allows us to get our hands on every puppy every day we're able to check, you know, is their suckle reflex strong? Is there anything that, you know, uh, for instance, before their eyes open, thank you so much, Amy. Well, he knows that. Yeah, he knows. <laughs> he knows that. We do this twice a day. Um, 
but before their eyes open, sometimes, um, it's not real common, but it does happen, the, you'll see an eye that is a little bit puffy when it's still closed, and they can get an infection underneath that eyelid. And if you don't get that out, they will lose the eye. So, breeders who you see just, oh, the dog had puppies and they're just in the box and the breeder's off sleeping or doing whatever they want, and they're not handling the dogs every day, they might miss something like that. A little thing that people don't know is, when people say the runt, this is the runt. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and they're like the same color, so it's even more obvious that he's yeah. smaller. These are the two oh boys. My God. <laughs> so this is big red, and this is little red. Huh. My boys. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is it ever um, difficult to find people to take? like some of these dogs or that are want these dogs? Um, not generally, as far as you mean like the runt or just this breed in particular. Like in, in general, like are you, is it just difficult for people to, you know, want to get one of these dogs or, or do we, you always have people who want We are, we turn away more people than we accept. Okay. Um, like for instance, you know, we have an application. You know that you filled it out. Yes. Mm -hmm. We do have some loaded questions on that mm -hmm. application. And they're there for a reason mm -hmm. because there are certain circumstances we don't allow the dogs to live in. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and I'm not going to say it because I don't want to give that away, but you know, it's on there because if you agree to this and you think that's a good idea, we're not going to sell you a dog. Uh -huh. um, so we, we're very particular where, where our puppies go. They have to live inside. We don't allow our dogs. Just last night I was speaking to a man who wanted a dog for property protection. Okay. There are plenty of breeders who will sell them a dog. I will not. Okay. Our dogs are strictly family dogs. They live in the house. They are part of your family. Um, you've read your contract. You know they can't be loaned, leased, gifted, wow. nothing. Wow. Now, if you can't keep the dog, you have to contact us. And if you have a family member, you know, well, great. You know, they can they can have a dog. You already know them. And we're not heartless like that, where we're just like, well, we have to have the dog back. But at the same time, we want to know where they're going so that we always have contact with them. Right. We know where each dog is. Um, it may take us going into the file cabinet to you know to know it. Not all of it stays in my head, but um, we're we're very particular, and people have to agree to do training. If you just want to get the dog and you think you know everything, well, you know you have to show us that you're willing to put the time in. Right. This, this breed needs a lot of training, and they're not a breed that can just be let to do what they want to do and grow up to be a good social dog mm -hmm. that can be trusted because their guardian instincts really do take over right. um, if they're let to make their own decisions. So there's a lot that goes into um, us approving families, mm -hmm. I guess is the best way to say it. And we spend a lot of time. So you have the raising of the dogs and you have the caring of the dogs and you have the constant education on new lines that are coming out and do new pedigrees match with you know pedigrees that you're using and what do you you know what is the what is the future of your program and believe it or not we've got two or three years our six month old puppies I already know who I'm breeding them to in two years mm -hmm. so there's a lot of planning that goes into it um, there's health testing so you can get all of your time invested and your heart attached to this dog and as a breeder you take them in to say do their hips and they say they're not great. Mm -hmm. As a pet, it doesn't matter. For a breeder, it matters. So now you've got this dog that, you know, potentially, we used to take our dogs out and show them first. Well, now we test, we do health and genetic testing first. Because if they don't pass that, there's no point in them being a champion because we can't utilize them in breeding program. So that, that's probably one of the hardest factors of being a breeder is that you you pick, you know, this is the cream of the crop, this is the one, this is exactly what I need. Not only is it a great dog, but it's perfect because we already know what we want to breed it with. Uh -huh. These are its faults and this is the one that's going to match it right. I know you guys are hungry. We're going to go make they, you some food. They have a really good, is that like the, the suckling thing? Yep. The supple reflex that you're talking yep. about? Yeah. And if they don't suckle, how do you, do you try to help them learn? Um, if they no? won't suckle, you have to tube feed them. Two feet. Okay. Um, this, where is she at? The girl who has a collar. She's laying right here. Okay. Um, let me show you off, Missy. You're about grown out of your collar. We need to take it off. When she was young, um, 
she would crawl off of, we talked about the heat, she would crawl off over here on the cold side, okay. and she would get cold. I know, I know you do. Um, and when she would get cold, she wouldn't nurse. Okay. So then she would go downhill and she would get dehydrated. Um, Two times, I had to take her out of here and put her, what, where, no, don't put them on my shoes, okay? Put, them over, put her over here. Yeah. Um, and she had to have sub-Q fluids and at that point she was cold so she wouldn't nurse even from the bottle. So I had to, two hands if you're gonna pick them up, I had to tube feed her. And then after she had the fluids and she got tube fed, she bounced right back and I can put her back out here. I'm going back a little bit to um, the whole like puppy buying process and everything that you were talking about, which I found was really interesting because you're very involved. <laughs> and I know, we know that she was very involved in that whole process. Are there like certain qualities that you think that a kind of course owner should have for to be able to like raise a puppy like this? Um, so a lot of people get focused on um, you have to be a dominant person to own this breed. Okay. And I don't think that that's necessarily an accurate way. Um, and having Dante, you've got a little taste of it, but a Corso is a, is a dog that you have to develop a relationship with. They aren't one that you can just be the quote alpha of the pack because they really take resentment to that. They want to be part of the pack and they'll respect you, but you have to earn their respect. So you can't just come in and rawr on the boss and I'm going to manhandle you because of course I will step up to you and say, eh, no, you're not. You know, and that's where oftentimes it goes wrong. And we try and we're going to leave it on her for another day until we put a bigger one on her, okay? So um, as far as people, we want people who are willing to learn. If they haven't had the breed, they don't understand the breed. We want people that are, are willing to, to sit down and take the education that, you know, we've done this a long time, and I'm not saying we know everything by any means, but if we don't, you know, I will send them to trainers who know what they're doing and YouTube channels where they can find information and things like that so that they aren't stuck in this I have to be the boss attitude because we do have European lines and European lines um, can be a little stronger. Um, in Europe when they earn their titles um, they also do what we call courage testing and what that means is that that dog is agitated by a stranger and they have to prove that they're going to defend their own. Um, not a lot of testing done for breeding purposes here in the States for that. Um, they do, um, there is one association that offers it, but they're very limited in how much they do. So for us as breeders, we like to maintain the temperament that a course it was supposed to be. Um, some breeders will say, you know, oh, they're great with kids and they're great with dogs and they're great, 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 and they just want to sell you the puppy and send you on your way. And that's really not the case. But what they've done is they've kind of bred the temperament out of them so that they can sell to a larger audience. Okay, um, so we like to keep their temperament where it should be. And you know, it, does it make us a little more selective? Yes, you have to have a fenced yard. You have to be willing to train your dog and you have to be willing to be educated. Um, and when you have problems, reach out to your breeder. Um, and that's, that's where buying from an educated breeder comes in handy. That's what people should look for. Here. Yeah. We get a lot of questions like, oh, I'm looking into um, to getting a paying course. Of, would this be a problem? Would that be a problem? Can it be in an apartment? Can it be um, with smaller dogs? So what are things that people that are looking into breed should see as red flags on themselves? Not that the dogs might have a problem, but their life, lifestyle might not necessarily match what's best for the breed. A corso is very moldable. They don't have to have a ton of exercise. They aren't, we have one family in New York. They live in a high rise in New York. Most people would say, you know, maybe you don't have the best lifestyle for a dog. And they had a lab and um, the lab would drive them crazy. You know, if you just had a bad day, we've all had bad days and you just come home and you just want to, you know, relax, maybe you have a headache, you're sick, whatever. And the lab, they said, you know, we always had to take the dog for a walk or it was just stir crazy in the house. And the Corso, they come home, it can have waited all day for them to come home. They know they have to take it outside to use the bathroom, and they come back and lay on the couch, and the dog is there snoring. They want to be with you. 
So they mold very well to a lot of different lifestyles. Now that said, it's not a dog really that wants to just sit and do nothing either. They need enrichment. So yes, it. It doesn't. She doesn't have a name yet. Well, maybe you can think of one for her. Thinking. <laughs> so you know, we have quite a few dogs actually that live in apartments and do just fine. But those people who have the dogs in apartments will go and take the dogs for a walk. It might not be every day, but they get out. And we have a lot of families in apartments, ironically, that love to hike. So it's like, you know, they're cooped up themselves and they don't have their own yard. So they go off and they have a lot of fun adventures with their dogs. And that's what's important, is that they need that mental stimulation as well as the physical stimulation. Um, some people who may not be able to physically get out, at least stimulate, stimulate the dog mentally. You know, they'll play little games like hide treats under cups and the dog has to figure out which one it is and you know there's a lot of things you can do within you know your own home that will give the dog the stimulation it's, it's needing not that they don't need exercise but so to answer that question there's not really a lifestyle that they don't fit in per se um, you, you just have to make sure that the dog is a priority in your life I think that's important because I'm seeing more and more and more people looking for tiny corsos and posting about them. And they're big and majestic, right? They're these awesome dogs, but they also like need a lot from you. You know, right. they need a lot, what you said, to be a priority. So that's very accurate. I learned that a lot with Dante. Yeah. He needs he needs to be and he needs to spend time with them. He needs to spend a lot of time with them. His name Pup. His name Pup? Okay, that's her name. We Pup. have a puppy named Pup. Pup. <laughs> she is the named Pup. Um, so, yeah. And the worst thing, I tell people, and sometimes it backs them off, because I say the worst thing you can do to a Corso is leave them alone. They hate it. Like, if you could take them everywhere, that's their ideal life, right? Um, and it applies to a lot of dogs, but they, yes, they Puppsicle? Update. Pupsicle now. <laughs> Pup sugar? Yeah. Pup sugar. Oh, third update, pup sugar. <laughs> start getting confusing. Stay, stay tuned. Uh, so, yeah, I totally forgot what I was even talking about. Uh, I think he's being alone. Yeah, they do. They hate, they hate to be alone. We were talking about how you have to be really involved with them. If you can like say a couple of things about what you think what maybe some challenges are for the breed or um, what like training methods you saw best um, while they're growing up. If you can like talk about that, that'd be pretty cool. Um, challenges are, so we see a lot of, you know, my dog is stubborn. I've never met a stubborn Corso. A Corso needs very, it, it's really dog training 101, but they need clear direction. Once a dog knows what you want from it and then it gets a reward, and of course I was very willing to work for your attention. Um, good boy. They're, oh my gosh, I was a good boy, you know. Um, so when we start our dogs and our puppies, um, we feed them, they don't have food out all the time. Their food becomes a competitive environment and that's what we want. We want them to be willing to work for their food. That way you can use their food as training. Good boy, here's a piece of your food. You don't have to. Uh, look for some high value reward and you can go then if the dog starts backing up and says I don't know that I want to work for my dog food anymore now you can get a piece of chicken you don't have to start with the chicken and then you have nowhere to go and the dog's like well I don't really want what you have so you know why do I do what you want uh, so for training though you know, we talked about not being quite so dominant with them and creating a, a bond the dog has to want to be, want to work for you um, so starting training young, even when it's simple things, like we spoke a little bit about, we teach the puppies that in order to be pet, they sit. They sit. Oh. I don't use any type of reward other than when you, they, what they want from me is attention. Mm -hmm. So as soon as their little butts hit the ground, good puppy, good puppy, and they learn to sit and wait. And then when I feed them, because we've worked on that, you know, for attention, you sit. And when I hold the food up and, I, and they look at me like, are you going to feed me? And I just hold it. They try and figure out in their mind, what is it that she's wanting? Mm -hmm. And then as soon as they sit, they get fed. So clear communication of 
this is the behavior I want. And that's where people kind of need to, what I want for our families and I'm trying to do is education first. Because if you understand a little bit about how you're gonna train the dog, then you can be more clear in your communication with your dog. You have to develop a relationship with them. And the dog has to respect you and you have to respect the dog. You can't just always be, I'm the boss and you do what I say because that's what I said. You know, not that we're compromising in the dog's behavior whatsoever. I'm not saying that, you know, we need to always just tell them they're good and praise them and, and they, they do need um, correction. But if my dogs do something wrong, because they, they grow up with or grow up with me, I am their leader. I'm not necessarily their boss, but they want to please me. You have control of your dog. And whether that you're a smaller person, so I'm sure you probably also get some flack for using a prong collar. Mm -hmm. And a prong collar that I, it's hanging over there. I make people when they come here, I put it on their wrist and I pull it tight. And they're like, oh, that doesn't hurt at all. I'm like, no, it's just, it's a training tool. It's just like an e-collar. When these, these tools were developed and they've gotten a bad reputation because people have used them wrong. Mm -hmm. People have left them on a growing dog out in the backyard, chained to a thing, and you see them removing this awful torture device from this dog. But what you don't see is that you know, all the dogs that are successfully trained, and Dante, who is a trained dog, that you can take out in public, that maybe someone else doesn't have a trained dog that's gonna approach Dante that may trigger a negative behavior, and that tool gives you who isn't, you know, you're not a, a big person, he outweighs you for sure. So that tool gives you the upper hand in saying, no, come here. And that's what's important about training is you don't have to be a six foot tall, 300 pound man to take care of a dog like this. You just need to rely on your training and make sure that you have the tools that if the situation you're in presents um, a behavior that the dog is really, you know, a stray dog comes up to you that's acting aggressive, you're going to tell Dante no and he's going to essentially, his first instinct is no, I'm overriding that that you said because I'm protecting him. And then you need that tool to say, I said no, and then he says, okay, you know, if, if you've got this, and that's where the trust and the bond comes in.